Please. All right, hello. I'm not used to a mic so sensitive, so I'm gonna talk like back here. And if that doesn't work, then I'll adjust, whatever. This is Show Me the Money, the, our port, Toronto Pwn to Own 2023 exploit and behind the scenes story. Uh, what this talk is about is our hack against the Xiaomi 13 Pro, which includes the full exploit chain that we used and also issues encountered during the research itself. And then we're gonna, we're gonna cover what happened during the Pwn to Own competition itself. And for a little bit of background on who we are, I'm Ken Gannon, I'm a principal security consultant at NCC Group, and I usually focus on hacking mobile shit. This is Ilyas. At the time of the competition, he was also part of NCC Group. He is a veteran Android malware reverse engineer, and this was his first time competing at Pwn to Own. So we got first time Pwn to Own, first time DEF CON. This is his first time in the US. This is a, a lot of stuff for this guy right here. So a little bit about us. So it was in 2022, no 2023 of last year, it was around May. Ilias was looking to do Pwn to Own. For those of you that don't know what Pwn to Own is, it is a zero day competition where you try to hack some devices and some prize money involved. And Ilias was looking to do Pwn to Own this year, last year for his first time. And so he started researching previous vulnerabilities, previous competitions to see what that was like. And then he came across my name because I've done exploits, I've done previous attempts at Pwn to Own and he realized, oh shit, I work at the same company as Ken Gannon, I'm gonna reach out to him. So it was like May of last year, we get together, we talk over teams and we discuss what we wanna hack. And we decided to hack the Samsung Galaxy S23. So that was as of May last, oh, it's, I will, I didn't see you there. So that was May of last year. And then July of last year, ZDI announces their list of devices. And as you can see on the screen, it includes the Xiaomi 13 Pro. So the thing about the Xiaomi 13 Pro though is that the Xiaomi devices has not been a target of Pwn to Own since 2020, the COVID pandemic. And him and I got together again and we were like, oh, this sounds interesting. Maybe we should try to hack this new device or we should try to stick with Samsung Galaxy S23. And the thing about our discussions at the time is that we were discussing this on July 13th of last year when the devices were announced. And as I said, we were thinking about Samsung Galaxy S23, but I have a history with uh, Samsung at this point. A lot of traumatic experience of the Samsung, including a failed pwn to own attempt in 2021 because I am a very shitty programmer. So because of that, and we decided that maybe we should just go for the Samsung, for the Xiaomi 13 Pro instead. Something new, something fresh. We, we just thought, you know, something that we both can learn together. What could possibly fucking go wrong, right? This is gonna be awesome. So let's talk about the Xiaomi 13 Pro. There's essentially two versions of this device, the global variant and the China variant. The global variant is available worldwide wherever you can get a Xiaomi device, whereas the China variant is typically only found in China. At a hardware level, they're exactly the same thing. Same camera, same processor, same board, same chipset. The only minor difference between these two models is the type of firmware that can be installed on each device. Uh, the China model can have the China firmware as, as well as what's called the global variant firmware. Whereas the global model can only install the global variant firmware. Now, the unique part about the global firmware though, is that depending on the settings, you can have it emulate different regions. Like for example, in Europe, in India, and in Taiwan, they have their own Taiwan, India, and Europe firmware or you can tell the global mother one to emulate a different region and it will become that region. Why this is important is because certain regions have certain apps enabled or disabled. For example, 
if you set the region to United Kingdom, the GetApps application, which is the Xiaomi uh, application store, will be enabled if the phone is set to the UK region. Whereas if you were to set it to United States region, the GetApps store is disabled. And this is just one example. Another one is that if you set the region to Russia, then the Yandex browser becomes enabled on the device. Keep in mind that this browser, the APK file, is in the firmware already. It's just that it gets enabled or disabled depending on what region the firmware is set to. Another example is that with the Spain region, the Opera browser becomes enabled. And uh, one more subject. And one more example, the Indonesia region, the WhatsApp uh, app becomes enabled or disabled. So at this point, we have multiple different regions, multiple apps being enabled, multiple apps being disabled. So we thought, well, why don't we determine what each region does, download all 400 plus applications from the phone, and start reverse engineering every single application? Except that's a really fucking bad idea because that's a lot of applications. So instead, we decided to just prioritize the Xiaomi developed applications, specifically the ones that were developed by Xiaomi for that phone. And so then 22 days later, we had three exploits for the GetApps application. And this is where Ilias is going to talk about them real quick. Hey everyone. I'm going to be talking about the app we exploited. <clears throat> So we found three different exploits in the GetApps application. This application is also what, the, what we ended up exploiting at point one. So we found three different ways to force install application. And the attack scenario is the following. Tapping a malicious uh, hyperlink in the web browser would result in automatically install any application available on the GetApp store without user consent. Two of the methods were unfortunately patched before the competition, and I'm going to show here the exploit code of those two patch exploits. So here's the first one um, that was used to install WhatsApp automatically. On the first screenshot, you can see the browsable intent code. And if you've never created a browsable intent hyperlink before, we've also put the Java code, which does the exact same thing. And there is an id equal com dot whatsapp parameter in there and that's what could be used to install any application available in getapps here's the second patch exploit on the left you can see the browsable intent code and again on the right you can see the java code which does the exact same thing it's a lot chunkier as you can see and if you base 64 decode that string, you'll be able to see the WhatsApp packet na package name in there. Before we can get into the third exploit, um, we need to talk a little bit about WebView in GetApps. Um, GetApps had a WebView which contained a JavaScript interface. And for 900 people, this means that JavaScript could be used to execute a set of Java functions defined in the application. It's defined in the JavaScript interface class. And some of those JavaScript interface functions were benign, like show toast function, for show toast functions, um, which literally just shows a toast, as you can see in the screenshot. But there were two interesting functions there for us for point one. The install function which installs any application available on the GetApps store without user consent, and the open app functions, which opens any specific application, again, without user consent. And this web view is obviously dangerous, and Xiaomi knows it. So they implemented some protection to ensure that attackers cannot arbitrarily open this web view and execute any of those JavaScript interface functions. And one of those protections was that whatever URL being loaded in the web view must be a valid URL. And by valid, I mean that it either starts with the HTTPS protocol and the domain should belong to a defined set of um, uh, whitelisted domains. All of them were owned by Xiaomi. And the other valid URL 
um, should start with the file protocol and the file should be located in the GitHub's private directory. A uh, GitHub pri private directory um, names was always web hyphen res hyphen some random numbers. So now we had a new plan. Th first, we can launch the web view and load a valid URL. Second, inject, inject some custom JavaScript code into the web view, possibly through cross site scripting. Third, having the JavaScript code execute the two JavaScript interface functions mentioned before. And fourth, got, get remote code execution. OK, step one. To launch the web view, we use the activity called join activity. This activity could be launched via browsable intent. Again, this means that this activity could be launched via a hyperlink in a website. And it was also really simple to tell join activity what URL we wanted to load in the web view. It was just a get parameter called URL. This is the proof of concept uh, which launched join activity and loaded the file detail.html that was in the GitHub's private folder. That detail.html is pretty blank, as you can see on the screenshots, but that's just because we didn't give him the application's data to use. So now step one is done. Let's move on to step two. We had two options to inject custom JavaScript. We could either load a Xiaomi domain URL and then pen test that URL and look for usable vulnerabilities. Or we can analyze the file in the private folder and look for user input vulnerabilities. We choose, for the, se we choose the second option. And now this research just became a JavaScript source code review job. And as you can see on, this, on the, the picture, this was my reaction when I realized what was going on. Um, Point one will make you do stuff you really don't want to do, but we still did it. Um, in, in the, uh, the web hyphen res folder, we had like HTML file and JavaScript file with similar names. As an example, we had the detail.html file, and this file would load the detail.chunk.js. Some JavaScript file would accept user input via get parameters. But also, all of those JavaScript files had a built-in function to filter out any cross-site scripting payloads. Well, except for one, one that we found. There was a file called integral dialog page.chunk.js, which failed to sanitize cross-site scripting payloads in one specific area. So let's try to get a dumb XSS payload working in this file. This was the initial payload that was used for testing. On the right, you can see the decoded version of it. So we had different inputs and we had different payloads. All of them started with XSS test, one, two, three, four, five, and they all ended with um, two characters that was uh, encoded. And those characters were double quote symbol and the less than symbol. On the left is what the web view looked like with the payloads, and on the right is a debugging window in Chrome. Our less than symbol character was unfiltered in one of the area, specifically the XSS test two. All the others were filter filtered the right way. So now with this XSS test two payload, we can try to just pop a simple alert box. And then, what the hell? We got some errors. Lockout was showing us disabled XSS checks, XSS errors, um, errors. So let's dig into that. Remember the protection against the web view that we mentioned earlier? There was another one, unfortunately. The GitHub's application had a built in XSS filter in the Java code itself. And it looked for XSS payload in the URL. So if the URL had any XSS payload found, then the URL would fail to load. And here is the list of the XSS filter. And 
as you can see, it detected our forward slash script string in our payload. At this point, we decided that maybe we shouldn't be using script string at all. Maybe because there might be other filters we haven't found yet, and also, script is just too obvious for an XSS payload. Okay, so going through the list and thinking about what could we use now, we realized that the Java XSS filter was just looking for string matches. So we thought, what if we could encode um, a less than symbol, um, a character in one of those payload, such as the less than symbol SVG? So that's what we tried, and we used um, the SVG unload to run the JavaScript alert box, and that's, that said, yeah, dumb XSS here. And boom, it worked. We finally have an XSS in the web view now. So step two is done. Let's move on to step three. Oops, sorry. Now let's try to call the, those JavaScript interface function mentioned earlier. To test, we tested our payload just to see if it, we could run the show toast function. And on the screenshot on the right, you can see that we managed to do that. So now, after some time, we did some reverse engineering and we came up with this lovely JavaScript payload to install any application. On the screenshot, you can see that we first called the install with the package name of the application we want to install, and then we run a loop um, and wait for the, the application to install, and then we use the open app with the package name again to open the application. So now there is just one problem. We didn't know what to install. So now what application should we install? Ideally, we would want some malware that we can control in the application store, so store somewhere. And I'm going to let Ken talk about his baby now. So for those of you that don't know, I am also an active contributor for the Android tool Drozer. Yay. For those of you that don't know what Drozer is, yay. Uh, and because I'm an active contributor, I know how to reskin it into an application called Sunfish, which does literally the same exact thing as Drozer, except it starts a bind shell on boot as well, and then I uploaded it to this Xiaomi app store. So for a little bit, on the Xiaomi app store, there was a, a copy of Drozer called Sunfish up on the app store. And that was fun. So we had a new payload. In this case, the payload is going to step one, install Sunfish, and then step two, open it after Sunfish is installed on the device. So all right, all the, piece, all the puzzle pieces are in place. Let's, uh, let's watch it do its thing real quick. We open up Google Chrome. Uh, in this case, we're going to, as you can see, it's a new copy of Chrome with all those pop-ups. We browse to the web server I had at my house uh, over HTTP because I'm lazy. But eventually what's going to happen is I will load the website and there's a yay POC hyperlink. Click that one link. This appears and then Sunfish gets installed and boom, Sunfish is now installed. The server has started as well. I put the phone down. At this point, I have the IP address of the phone that reached out to my web server as well. And so with the bind shell open, all I had to do was use my reskinned Drozer console thingy whatever to connect to the Drozer application installed on the phone. And then for, per the rules of Pwn to Own, as long as you get RCE on the device, that is good enough, including just RCE as a single application. So in this case, I'm running ID and who am I as Sunfish. There we go. One click to, one click to RCE. Yay! So we got RCE. All the steps are done. And like I said, that was only 22 days later. We had 22 days of research time. We had 77 more days to go to to do whatever the fuck we wanted. Everything was awesome. Nothing could have possibly gone wrong. Let's discuss what went wrong. So, late August of 2023, Xiaomi made changes to their GetApp server. Uh, specifically, one of, one of the changes that they made was that the install parameter, the install function that we were using, 
now required a shit ton more code. Our payload was now chonky as fuck. But wait, there's more. You see, this payload did not work in all parts of the world. So for a little bit of background, last year and around August, late August 2023, I went on vacation to Japan and the Philippines. And this new chonky install payload would work in Japan and the United Kingdom, thanks to Ilias here being based in the United Kingdom, but it fucking wouldn't work in the Philippines for some reason. And while in uh, Japan and the Philippines, I noticed that the GetApps application was showing different content based on the physical location of the phone. Not the IP address. I'm talking about doing a factory reset and you, you know, you go factory reset, you go through the whole setup, the cell phone towers are, the cell phone signal is now enabled on the phone. And for some reason, after you do a factory reset and you go through initial setup, there was stuff on the, uh, in, in the GetApps store that was exclusive to that one region. And what I also realized at the time, or as we were doing like research, like figuring out what is going on, uh, VPN did not affect this. The reason I was talking about factory reset is because during Pwn to Own specifically, uh, they typically factory reset their phone before every single uh, entry goes up. And so then during a factory reset process, the cell phone tower, the cell phone signal antenna is enabled. So we wanted to mimic that. And we realized that just really weird stuff was happening with the GetApp store, depending on where I was in Japan and the Philippines. And so then after looking at the developer documentation and looking at uh, the, the developer portal I had access to since I uploaded some fish to their app store, I realized that there were some places that were launched. Uh, for example, GetApps was not launched in the US, UK, and Japan, but it was launched in the Philippines. Now, I don't have definitive proof, but this is literally the only thing I could think of at the moment. Maybe we were seeing different behavior in the Philippines because the GetApp store was not was launched in the Philippines but was not launched anywhere else that we've been to. Now thankfully because we are awesome eventually we found a way for the payload to work in the Philippines but that payload would only work in the Philippines it would not work in US UK or Japan. We didn't know what to do because another issue came up Pwn to own that we were going to takes place in Canada. Do we have a payload that works in Canada? We, I like, it's a theory. This whole like launch, not launch thing is just a theory. And technically, GetApps was not launched in Canada. So maybe, maybe our GetApps, our non launch payload would work in Canada. We're not entirely sure. It'd be nice to confirm. Well, NCC Group is a global company and we have offices in Canada. So surely we can just, no, no, we're not, we're not working with the Canada office for this talk because you cannot get the Xiaomi 13 Pro in Canada. So if you try to get the Xiaomi 13 Pro here in the US, you're gonna go through eBay. You're gonna go through a, a seller on eBay or on Amazon or something to get the phone. Uh, in fact, my phone, I know for a fact, it it was a China model imported here from China, sold by a, a Chinese guy on eBay. I could not procure the Xiaomi 13 Pro in Canada. eBay Canada, Amazon Canada, none of the cell phone providers in Canada, like I could not get it in Canada. So, you know, I'm in North America, I might as well just send my phone to Canada. No, no, I'm not sending my phone to Canada. Because another issue came up with my schedule specifically. You see, in August of 2023, uh, or 2023 in general, NCC announced that they were going to open an office in the Philippines. And I was chosen to go out to Manila to spend the rest of 2023 in the Philippines to help set it up. Uh, fun fact, I'm still in the Philippines. So, because of this, I had a very, very weird travel schedule last year. Because, as I said earlier, I went on a vacation, right? I come back from vacation on September 10th. 
And then on September 11 through 14, I'm at my house, I'm like packing, I'm like trying to get ready because I'm going to be spending the rest of the year in the Philippines. Uh, and then on Friday the 15th, I'm, and I do this thing in Vermont for like a race, I come back on the 17th. And then again, 18 through 20, I'm at home. And then the 21st of September, I fly to the Philippines. That leaves only seven business days where I am in the US. So that's the schedule. Uh, it's a little bit hectic, but it gets more hectic, I promise. But first, we wanna t I wanna talk about why this those seven days sucks. Because it is too risky to send a phone to Canada, pay Canada import taxes, test and develop and exploit, send the phone back to the US, and then pay US import taxes all in seven days. That is not gonna happen. Well, what if I just send my phone to Canada and keep it there? Well, I, I, the Philippines has a lot of Xiaomi stores. That's, there's literally a picture of a Xiaomi store that I sent to Ilias when I found my first one. And they were selling Xiaomi 13 Pros for 1,000 US dollars. I can just go to the Philippines and get a new phone, right? Well, the problem is that now we're dealing with three different time zones. If I'm in the Philippines, he's in the UK, and the Canada consultants are in Eastern Standard Time. Uh, for those of you that don't know, half of the time of the year, the Eastern Standard Time and the Philippines are literally 12 hours, 12 hour difference. And trying to manage those time zones on top of the consultants in Canada being available, that sounds like way too much fucking stress for a theory. On top of that, the biggest issue, the biggest threat to any pawn to own competition are the patches. So at this point, we had a good idea as to how the patches worked. Uh, first, during the first week of, uh, of every month, a firmware gets updated to the beta channel. And, in, and as after that first week in the beta channel, the firmware also gets put in the stable channel. With that firmware update comes a new GetApps update. Every single month, there is a new update for GetApps. So the real schedule now is that after I fly back to the Philippines, no one is in the US to test the exploit, or no one's in North America to test the exploit. A no one's in the hey, you what? If I try shut. All right. <laughs> no one's in North America. Hey, we're back. Yay. All right. Yeah, like I said, no one's back in the, no one's in here in North America to test stuff. And we have a new patch coming out sometime, supposedly October 9th, right? I really, really want to test this theory though. I really, really do. Because here's the thing. We think that Canada is a non-launched region, right? just like uh, with UK, or UK and US uh, and Japan, if we can group, and this is just a theory we had at the moment, if we could group Canada into that non-launched region and test and make sure that, we, that that theory is true, then let's say that October rolls around and they release their patch, right? All we would need is Ilias here to test his UK, uh, his exploit in the UK. And if it works, then in theory, it should work in the US, in Japan, and in Canada. So earlier I mentioned that it costs 1,000 US dollars to buy a new phone. Another thing that costs 1,000 US dollars is to go to Canada literally for a day, literally hang out in the Marriott Hotel at Toronto Airport and test the exploit, and then fly back the next day. So that's what I did. Um, let's see, on September 17, I fly back for my race. On September 18, I fly back to Toronto to test the exploit. On September 19, uh, I fly back home. And then on September 21, I fly to Manila. So many miles. And, like I, and after a few hours in Toronto, it was confirmed. We did it. We, we confirmed that this was a non-launched region. And so now, 
If our, if October rolls around, our exploit works in the UK, we should be good. Everything is awesome. Oh, we are, uh, we are so excited for everything to happen and we are going to get our, uh, get our first pwn to own win. Right, Elias? Yeah. So, <laughs> October rolls around. As expected, GetApps releases their, their update in October. It's literally October 9th. I have it marked down in my calendar and we confirm that the exploit works. We have our books flight for September 20th. I'm flying from the Philippines. He's flying from the UK. We, all this is good to go. We're gonna fucking do this. No, hold on. One week before Pwn to Own, Xiaomi releases an out of band update to GetX, which happened to fucking remove the file that we were going to exploit. Specifically, the file was removed from the APK file itself. For those of you that are not Android, uh, that means that the file was removed from the installer file of the app itself. It was no longer there. But thankfully, they are, Xiaomi also has shitty programmers <laughs> because they forgot to remove the file from the device if it was already there. So in theory, assuming that we show up to Pwn to Own and we're one of the first few people to hack the phone, and like I said earlier, uh, uh, ZDI usually uh, factory resets the de target device per uh, competition. They usually have multiple devices. So as long as we could hack one of the initial devices before they factory reset it again, again, it's a dice roll, but there's still a chance. We still follow through. We still decide, okay, this is not that big a deal. Let's fucking do this. So we fly out to Canada. It is now October 20th. Him and I are both on our flights, literally while I'm on the plane. And the Saturday before Pwn to Own, there is another GetApps update. Now, this is the most interesting part because they introduced a new thing in GetApps where they can modify what files are on the device using Google Firebase, which is really, really cool. And for some reason, they pushed our file back to the device. Like if you removed, if you went in and manually removed the file that we were going to exploit, they just pushed it back for us. That's so fucking convenient. Thank you, Xiaomi. Except they added one more thing. So we were going to exploit the activity, join activity, as we, as Ilya said. But they happened to add code to that one activity where if the intent came from any of these four browsers, the uh, Xiaomi browser, uh, the Android HTML viewer, the Android NFC, or Google fucking Chrome, then join activity will not launch. What the fuck, Xiaomi? As you all saw in my video earlier, we use specifically Google Chrome. We can't, there's no other browsers on this phone that we can use. Except there is, because if you set the region to Spain, the Opera browser is enabled on the phone. So technically we had an exploit for the country of Spain specifically, which is still technically a zero day because now it's a zero day in Spain. So we told ZDI this, we told them, hey, Xiaomi is doing some shitty stuff, but Spain. And ZDI goes, Spain. And we're good to go. All right, we dodged another bullet. We can now, we can do this. We can hack a Xiaomi 13 Pro. The first day of the competition, Xiaomi starts disabling the ability to install apps from their app store. Now, I don't know if this was a global thing. I genuinely don't know. I don't talk to many Xiaomi users. After this, I don't want to. But the very least, the people in Toronto area that were, that were also going to hack the Xiaomi 13 Pro, they corroborated it. They all saw the same issue that we saw. It was a hit or miss whether an application would install. It was like a 20% chance that we could install an application. And they killed my boy. This, this re genuinely hurt. <laughs> that I could not install Sunfish at all. It was a 0% success rate. So 
On that day, there were two teams that were supposed to go and hack the Xiaomi 13 Pro. Uh, it was us at NCC Group, and it was uh, the awesome people at Team Viatel. Uh, Team Viatel went first, we went second. Uh, we discussed with ZDI what happened, and we're like, what the fuck do we do? Oh wait, can we please just install one random app from the App Store? And they go, okay. And we did. We did it. Technically that works because we showed ZDI that we had malware up on the App Store. ZDI already heard from other contestants around the area that Xiaomi was doing something very funky with their App Store and they're like fine, good enough. So Team Viatel managed to install Discord and I, we installed no picks, color by number and pixel. Yeah, it was that app. I literally just found another random app on the App Store and we installed it. And we did it! We got a win! Yay! Except that's not the end of the story because the next day, Xiaomi releases another update. First, they remove the file that we exploited and now nothing installs from the App Store, period. Er, the day before, there was like a 20% success rate on installing something, no. The next day, nothing gets installed, period. And on top of that, they had a code to block Yandex and the Opera. <laughs> you can't make this shit up. So the rest of the week, it was just failure after failure after failure after failure. Unfortunately, it's pretty obvious why nothing would install. They removed a bunch of other stuff from the app. And you know, the, the lesson of this story is that during Pound to Own specifically, Xiaomi is the most secure phone in the world. <laughs> if there was one phone I would have on me during Pound to Own specifically, especially here at DEF CON where nothing bad happens, it's a Xiaomi 13 Pro during Pound to Own. There is one more side to this story that I think everyone here should check out eventually. Uh, my friend Max Floyd, who was also a competitor last year at Pound to Own, uh, he says, and I quote, Props to the Xiaomi crew who proved you can patch RCE bugs completely remotely in only a few hours and also break your flagship device across the country as long as you're doing it to be a dick. Not because you actually care about fixing things. If you guys want, he actually talked earlier this year at OffensiveCon about his side of the story as well as his exploit. I do recommend you all check it out. It's also a fun time. So after Pwn's own, what happened? The browser blocking code got removed for some reason and applications can install just like normal. Everything works. Everything is back to normal. Now both us and Team Viatel never got credit from Xiaomi. Usually with a vendor they are like, hey, we want to acknowledge so and so working together with, with ZDI to do so and so. No, they said fuck you. We don't, we don't want to acknowledge you. So Zero Day Initiative had to be the one to give us CVE numbers. And they said something in their posting that was possibly my favorite quote of this entire time. Xiaomi informed ZDI they would assign a CVE but never follow through. Except they did specifically to Team Viatel a few days later. But not us. Where's my fucking CVE, Xiaomi? And that's it. That's the end of our story. Yay! I hope they get the worst vendor response at Pony Awards. Yay! Uh, we're also very introverted, so we're going to take questions out there instead of up here, if you guys don't mind, all right? All right, thank you for coming. Yay!